awakening. The dragon was no longer than his forearm, yet it was dignified and noble. Its scales were deep sapphire blue, the same color as the stone, but not a stone, he realized, an egg. The dragon fanned its wings, they were what had made it appear so contorted. The wings were several times longer than its body, and ribbed with thin fingers of bone that extended from wings front the wings from front edge, forming a line of widely spaced talons. The dragon's head was roughly triangular, two diminutive white white fangs curved down from its upper jaw. They looked very sharp. Its claws were also white, like polished ivory and slightly serrated on the inside curve. A line of small spikes ran down the creature's spine from the base of its head to the tip of its tail. A hollow where its neck and shoulders jointed created a larger than normal gap between the spikes. Aragon shifted slightly and the dragon's head snapped round, hard, ice-cold, blue eyes fixed on him. He kept very still, it might be a formidable enemy if it decided to attack. The dragon lost interest in Aragon and awkwardly explored the room, squealing as it bumped into a wall or furniture. With a flutter of wings, it leapt onto the bed and crawled to his pillow, squeaking. Its mouth was open pitifully like a young bird's, displaying rows of pointed teeth. Aragon sat cautiously on the end of the bed. The dragon smelled his hand nibbled his sleeve. He pulled his arm back. A smile tugged at Aragon's lips as he looked at the small creature. Tentatively, he reached out with a right, his right hand and touched its flank. A blast of icy energy surged into his hand and raced up his arm, burning his veins like liquid fire. He fell back with a wild cry. An iron clang filled his ears and he heard a soundless scream of rage. Every part of his body seared with pain. He struggled to move, but was unable to. After what seemed like hours, warmth seeped back into his limbs, leaving them tingling. Shivering uncontrollably, he pushed himself upright. His hand was numb, his fingers paralyzed. Alarmed, he watched as the middle of his palm shimmered and formed a diffused white opal, oval. The skin itched and burned like a spider bite. His heart pounded frantically. Aragon blinked, trying to understand what had occurred. Something brushed against his consciousness like a finger trailing over his skin. He felt it again, but this time it solidified into a tendril of thought, through which he could feel a growing curiosity. It was as if an invisible wall surrounding his thoughts had fallen away, and he was now free to reach out with his mind. He was afraid that without anything to hold him back, he would float out of its body and be unable to return, becoming a spirit of the ether. Scared, he pulled away from the contact. The new sense vanished, as if he had closed, as if he had closed his eyes. He glared suspiciously at the motionless dragon. A scaly leg scraped against his side, and he jerked back, but the energy did not shock him again. Puzzled, he rubbed the dragon's head with his right hand. A light tingling ran up his arm. The dragon nuzzled him, arching its back like a cat. He slid a finger over its thing, thin, whim, thin wing membrane. They felt like old parchment, velvety and warm, but still slightly damp. Hundreds of slender veins pulsed through them. Again, the tendril touched his mind, but this time, instead of curiosity, he sensed an overpowering, ravening, ravenous hunger. He got up with a sigh. This was a dangerous animal, that, of that he was sure, yet it seemed so helpless crawling on his bed, he could only wonder if there was any harm in keeping it. The dragon wailed in a reedy tone as it looked for food. Aragon quickly scratched its head to keep it quiet. I'll think about this later, he decided and left the room, carefully closing the door. Returning with two strips of dried meat, he found the dragon sitting on the windowsill watching the moon. He cut the meat into small squares and offered one to the dragon. 
It smelled the square cautiously, then jabbed its head forward like a snake and snatched the meat from his fingers, swallowing the whole, swallowing it whole with a particular jerk, peculiar jerk. The dragon prodded Aragon's hand for more food. He fed it, careful to keep his fingers out of the way. By the time there was only one square left, the dragon's be belly was bulging. He proffered the last piece. The dragon considered it for a moment, then lazily snapped it up. Done eating it, crawled onto his arm and curled against his chest. Then it snorted, a puff of dark smoke rising from its nostrils. Aragon looked at it with wonder. Just when he thought the dragon was asleep, a low humming came from its, its vibrating throat. Gently, he carried it to its bed and set it by his pillow. The dragon, eyes closed, wrapped its tail around the bedpost contentedly. Aragon lay next to it, flexing his hand in the near darkness. He faced a painful dilemma. By raising a dragon, he could become a rider. Myths and stories about riders were treasured, and being one would automatically place him among those legends. However, if the Empire discovered the dragon, no one could or would help them. The simplest solution was to just kill the dragon, but the idea was repugnant, and he rejected it. Dragons were too revered for him to even consider that. Besides, what could betray us? He thought, we live in a remote area and have done nothing to draw attention. The problem was convincing Garo and Rorin to let him keep the dragon. Neither of them would care to have a dragon around. I could raise it in secret. In a month or two it would be too large for Garo to get rid of. But will he accept it? Even if he does, I can... Can I get enough food for the dragon while he's hiding? It's no la larger than a small cat but it ate an entire handful of meat. I suppose it'll be able to hunt for itself eventually, but how long till then? Will it be able to survive the cold outside? All the same, he wanted the dragon. The more he thought about it, the surer he was. However, things might work out with Garo. Think Aragon would do everything he could to protect it. Determined, he fell asleep with the dragon curled against him. When dawn came, the dragon was sitting atop his bedpost, like an ancient sentinel welcoming the new day. Aragon marveled at its color. He had never seen such a clear, hard blue. Its scales were like hundreds of small gemstones. He noticed that the white oval on his palm, where he had touched the dragon, had a silvery sheen. He hoped that he could hide it by keeping his hands dirty. The dragon launched off the post and glided to the floor. Aragon gingerly picked it up and left the quiet house, pausing to grab meat, several leather straps, as many rags as he could carry. The crisp morning was beautiful. A fresh layer of snow covered the farm. He smiled as the small creature looked round with interest from the safety of his arms. Hurrying towards the fields, he walked silently into the dark forest, searching for a safe place for the, er for the dragon to stay. Eventually, he found a roaring, a rowan tree, standing alone on a barren knoll, its branches snow-tipped grey fingers that reached towards the sky. He set the dragon down by the base of, it, of the trunk and shook the leather onto the ground. Within a few, with a few deft movements, he made a noose and slipped it over the dragon's head as it explored those snowy clumps surrounding the tree. The leather was worn, but it would hold. He watched the dragon curl around and then untied the noose from its neck and fashioned a makeshift harness for its legs so the dragon would not strangle itself. Next, he gathered an armful of sticks and built a crude hut high in the branches, layering the inside with rags and stashing the meat. Snow fell on his face as the tree swayed. He hung more rags over the front of the shelter to keep the heat inside. Pleased, he surveyed his work. Time to show you your new home, he said and lifted the dragon up into the branches. It wriggled, trying to get free, then clambered on into the hut, where it ate a piece of meat, curled up, and blinked coyly at him. You'll be fine as long as you stay in here, he instructed. The dragon blinked again. 
Sure that it had not understood him, Aragon groped with his mind until he felt the dragon's consciousness. Again he had the terrible feeling of openness, of a space so large that it pressed down on him like a heavy blanket. Summoning his strength, he focused on the dragon and tried to impress upon it one idea. Stay here. The dragon stopped moving and cocked his head at him. He pushed harder. Stay here. A dim acknowledgement came tentatively through the link, but Aragon wondered if it really understood. After all, it's only an animal. He retreated from the contact with a relief that, and felt the safety of his own mind develop, envelop him. Aragon left the tree, casting glances backward. The dragon stuck his head out of the shelter and watched with large eyes as he left. After a hurried walk home, he, sn he sneaked back into his room to dispose of the egg fragments. He was sure Garo and Roran would not notice the egg's absence. It had faded from their thoughts after they learned it could not be sold. When his family got up, Roran mentioned that he had heard some noises during the night, but to Aragon's relief did not pursue the issue. Aragon's enthusiasm made the day go by quickly. The mark on his hand proved easy to hide, so he soon stopped worrying about it. Before long, he headed back to the Rowan, carrying sausages he had pilfered from the cellar. With apprehension, he approached the tree. Is the dragon able to survive outside in winter? His fears were groundless. The dragon was perched on a branch, gnawing at something between its front, its front legs. It started squeaking excitedly when it saw him. He was pleased to see that it had re remained in the tree, above the branch, above the reach of large predators. As soon as he dropped the sausages at the base of the trunk, the dragon glided down. While it voraciously tore apart the food, Aragon examined the shelter. All the meat he left was gone, but the hut was intact, and tufts of feathers littered the floor. Good, it can get his own food. It struck him that he did not know if the dragon was a he or a she. He lifted and turned it over, ignoring the squeals of displeasure, but was unable to find any distinguishing marks. Seems like it won't give up any secrets without a struggle. He spent a long time with the dragon. He untied it, set it on his shoulder, and went out to explore the woods. The snow-laden trees watched over them like, a, like solemn pillars of a great cathedral. In that isolation, Aragon showed the dragon what he knew about the forest, not caring if it understood his meaning. It was the simple act of sharing that mattered. He talked to it continuously. The dragon gazed back at him with bright eyes, drinking in his words. For a while, he just sat with it resting in his arms and watched it with wonder, still stunned by recent events. Aragon started for home at sunset, conscious of two hard blue eyes drilling into his back. Indignant at being left behind. That night, he brooded about all the things that could happen to a small and unprotected animal. Thoughts of ice storms and vicious animals tormented him. It took hours for him to find sleep. His dreams were of foxes and black wolves tearing at the dragon with bloody teeth. In the sunrise glow, Aragon ran from the house with food and scraps of cloth, extra insulation for the shelter. He found the dragon awake and safe, watching the sunrise from high in the tree. He fervently thanked all the gods, known and unknown. The dragon came down to the ground, and as he approached, as he approached and it leapt into his arms, huddling close to his chest. The cold had not harmed it, but it seemed frightened. A puff of dark smoke blew out of its nostrils. He stroked it comfortingly and sat with it with his back to the rowan, murmuring softly. He still kept here he, he kept still as the dragon buried his head in his coat its head in his coat. After a while it crawled out of his embrace and onto his shoulder. He fed it, then wrapped the new rags round the hut. They played together for a time, but Aragon had to return to the house before long. A smooth routine was quickly established. Every morning, Aragon ran out to the tree and gave the dragon breakfast before hurrying back. During the day, 
he attacked his chores until they were finished and he could visit the dragon again. Both Garo and Dorin noticed his behaviour and asked why he spent so much time outside. Aragorn just shrugged and started checking to make sure he was not followed to the tree. After the first few days, he stopped worrying that a mishap would befall the dragon. Its growth was explosive. It would soon be safe from most dangers. The dragon doubled in size in the first week. Four days later, it was as high as his knee. It no longer fit inside the hut in the Rorin, Rowan, so Aragorn was forced to build a hidden shelter on the ground. The task took him three days. When the dragon was a fortnight old, Aragorn was compelled to let it roam free because it needed so much food. The first time he untied it, only the force of, its, of his will kept it from following him back to the farm. Every time it tried, he pushed it away with his mind until it learned to avoid the house and its other inhabitants. As he impressed on the dragon the importance of hunting only in the spine, there was less of a chance of being seen. Farmers would notice if game started disappearing from Palancar Valley. It made him feel both safer and uneasy when the dragon was so far away. The mental contact he shared with the dragon waxed stronger each day. He found that although it did not comprehend words, he could communicate it with, with it through images or emotions. It was an imprecise met method, however, and he was often misunderstood. The range at which they could touch each other's thoughts expanded rapidly. Soon Aragorn could contact the dragon anywhere within three leagues. He often did so, and the dragon in turn would lightly brush against his mind. These mute conversations filled his working hours. There was always a small part of him connected to the dragon, ignored at times but never forgotten. When he talked with people, the contact was distracting like a fly buzzing in his ear. As the dragon matured, its squeaks deepened to a roar and the humming became a low rumble. Yet the dragon did not breathe fire, which concerned him. He had seen it blow smoke when it was upset, but there was never a hint of flame. When the month ended, Aragorn's elbow was level with the dragon's shoulder. In that brief span, it had transformed from a small, weak, in, weak animal to a powerful beast. Its hard scales were as tough as chainmail armor, its teeth like daggers. Aragorn took long walks in the evening with the dragon padding beside him. When they found a clearing, he would settle against a tree and watch the dragon soar through the air. He loved to see it fly and regretted, regretted that it was not yet big enough to ride. He often sat beside the dragon and rubbed its back, feeling sinews and corded muscles flex under his hands. Despite Aragorn's efforts, the forest around the farm filled with signs of the dragon's existence. It was impossible to erase all the huge four-clawed footprints sunk deep into the snow, and he refused to even try to hide the huge the, try to hide the giant dung heaps that were becoming far too common. The dragon had rubbed against trees, stripping off the bark, and had sharpened his claws on dead logs, leaving gashes inches deep. If Garo or Rorin went too far beyond the farm's boundaries, they would discover the dragon. Aragorn could imagine no worse way for the truth to come out, so he decided to preempt it by explaining everything to them. He wanted to, know, to do two things first, though. Give the dragon a suitable name, and learn more about dragons in general. To that end, he needed to talk with Brom, a master of epics and legends, the only places, places where dragon lore survived. So when Rorin went to get a chisel repaired in Carvajal, Aragorn volunteered to go with him. The evening before they left, Aragorn went to a small clearing in the forest and called the dragon with his mind. After a moment, he saw a fast-moving speck in the dusky sky. The dragon dived towards him, pulled up sharp sharply, then leveled off above the trees. He heard a low-pitched whistle as air rushed over his wings. Its wings, he banked slowly... To his left, it banked slowly to its left, then spiraled gently to the ground. The dragon backflapped for balance with a deep, muffled thwump as it landed. 
Aragorn opened his mind, still uncomfortable with the, with the strange sensation, and told the dragon that he was leaving. It snorted with unease. It attempt he attempted to soothe it, soothe it with a calming mental picture, but the dragon whipped its tail unsatisfied. He rested his hand on its shoulder and tried to radiate peace and serenity. Scales bumped under his fingers as he patted it gently. A single word rang in his head, clear and deep. Aragon. It was solemn and sad, as if un an unbreakable pact were being sealed. He stared at the dragon, and a cold tingle ran down his arm. Aragon. A hard knot formed in his stomach as an unfathomable sapphire eyes gazed back at him. For the first time, he did not think of the dragon as an animal. It was something else, something different. He raced home, trying to escape the dragon. My dragon. Aragon.